is indeed a joy to be here and thank you for your kind invitation. Last time I was here it was just prior to Christmas and uh, I was blessed when I came the last time. If you have your Bibles I want to read from the book of Hebrews and chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll read the first 10 verses. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. One word that dominates these verses we have read is rest. We all know what the word rest means. We all know the benefits of taking a rest, be it a nap, be it just going to lie down or whatever, we all know the benefits of rest. In fact, the medical profession tell us that a rest is good for us to recharge the batteries. It's good not only for us physically, but also for us emotionally and our mental health also. But this morning I want to speak of a different kind of rest. Not a physical rest, but a spiritual rest. In fact, to be more specific, God's rest. God has a rest for his people. And my question this morning to each of you and to myself, are we experiencing the benefits of God's rest? Day by day, whatever the circumstances we may be facing at this moment, are we resting in God? We may be going through a storm, figuratively speaking. We may be being tossed and turned emotionally, internally. But even despite all of that, God offers his people rest. And that's what I want to consider this morning. And in this passage, we see three stages of God's rest. And the first stage is rooted in creation itself. Verse 4 tells us, For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And of course, if you read through the early chapters of Genesis and the account of creation, we'll see that God created the world and he took that creation period over six days. Now, what I find significant is that when you read the account of creation, on each day God creates something, you will read the following words or words to this effect. You will read and the evening and the morning was the first day and the evening and the morning was the second day and the evening and the morning was the third day and so on but what is significant 
is that whenever you come to the seventh day after God had finished creating, you do not read. And the evening and the morning was the seventh day. And the implication, I believe, is that on that seventh day God rested and his rest is still ongoing. And that's logical when you consider in our passage we've just read that God has a rest for his people. It's his own rest. Now here's somewhat of a contradiction, a paradox. While God rests, he still works. He is resting and yet at the same time he is working. Now from our perspective, from our human finite minds, we don't associate rest with work. We see them almost as opposites. But God rests and yet at the same time he works. Jesus himself said, my father works and I must do the works of him who sent me. The psalmist tells us that God's resting place is where he sits enthroned. His resting place is where he sits on the throne. Now we associate sitting with resting. And while God sits on the throne, while he rests on the throne, at the same time he rules from that same throne. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He's resting and he's ruling. Resting and working at the very same time. To use an example that might help us in some way grasp something of what that means. Suppose you needed a computer and you went out and you bought yourself a computer. And you bring it home, take it out of the box, you plug it in, turn it on, and then as the computer boots up, you begin to install various software programs. And so you install the software and you run it. Now when all of that is finished, you don't turn the computer off and never turn it on again. No, you begin to use it for the very purpose for which you bought it. And if you think of those six days of creation as God's setup program, if you will, like setting up a computer and installing various pieces of software, when that's all done, he then takes up the controls. And he begins to work out all things in accordance with the counsel of his own will. He's resting and yet he's working at the very same time. And so our writer to the book of Hebrews in chapter 4 tells us that God's rest begins on that seventh day. But as you consider the Old Testament, God's rest began to be commemorated, if you will, in the law of Moses. The fourth commandment, I believe it is, was that the children of Israel were to remember the seventh or the Sabbath day. Wasn't a day to be lazy and to put their feet up, so to speak. No, they were to consciously remember that original seventh day. They were to cast their minds back and put their focus on God and his very purpose of creation for which they as a nation were a part of. They had a role in God's purposes for creation and they were to remember that seventh day where God rested after his creative acts and to realize they're a part of his purpose for that creation. The Sabbath was a day, and a day is a measurement of time. And the Sabbath essentially was when man's time and God's time came together. Where they began to 
put their focus on him. And then again, through the law of Moses, we see this principle of the seventh day, that day of rest, being extended. And the law said that every six years, the very land had to undergo a rest. For six years, people would plow, they would plant, they would harvest, they would reap. But on the seventh year, the very land itself had to undergo a rest for one whole year. And the experts, the horticulturalists, tell us that when land is rested, it becomes much more productive for the growing of crops. And so we see this principle of rest, beginning with God, being remembered by his people, now being extended to the very land in which they lived in. But then God takes it a step further. And he tells his people that when the land would undergo a rest on the seventh time, in other words, the seventh Sabbath year cycle. Now the Sabbath year cycle was six years. So on the seventh Sabbath year cycle, which would be 49 years, the land would undergo rest and during that time it would get ready, the people of God would be ready to welcome in the 50th year. And it would be welcomed in with great fanfare, trumpets would be blown. It's called the year of Jubilee. It was a once in a lifetime experience. It was a year of liberty. It was a year of a new beginning. And several things happened during that 50th year, during that year of Jubilee. Debts were cancelled. Slaves were released. Property was restored. It was a year for social justice, for freedom, for pardon, release and restoration. A new beginning. A once in a lifetime event. The year of Jubilee. Rest begins with God on that seventh day. Extended to the law where people, his people would remember that day of rest and remember creation and its purposes and their purpose in it. Then the land would undergo rest and then every 50 years would be that year of Jubilee. And this was all going somewhere. There was a prophetic dimension to it. And the prophet Isaiah, speaking of this year of Jubilee, note these words, they're familiar to us. In Isaiah 61, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of of Jubilee. Isaiah, prophetically speaking here, speaks about this year of Jubilee. But not only does his prophetic word harken back to the past, but it looks forward to the future. And after Jesus was baptized, and went through that wilderness and emerged in the power of the Spirit. He went into the synagogue and he took the scroll of Isaiah and he searched specifically for what we know as Isaiah 61 and he quoted, he read out the words I've just read and he applied them to himself. And then he began to make the announcement that time is fulfilled. In other words, this whole concept of rest found its fulfillment in Christ himself. It was all going somewhere. Paul puts it like this. He tells us that the Sabbaths, that the, the Jewish holidays and feasts were the shadows. 
But he says the substance is in Christ. They were all signposts pointing, looking forward to the substance which they as shadows were representing. And the substance, Paul says, is Christ himself. And in the verses we have read in the book of Hebrews, the writer here essentially is restating what we've just been considering. That creation brought in that first Sabbath rest where God rested and then extended that rest to his people and to their very land, pointing to that year of Jubilee. But I want us to notice here what the writer says also in verse 5. Of, of, we're still in Hebrews chapter 4. He says, and again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Now this is a quotation from the Old Testament. And the picture here is that of the wanderings of the children of Israel. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And the promised land, the writer here tells us, is a picture of God's rest. And we know that many of the children of Israel did not enter into the promised land. They did not enter in to God's rest. And the writer tells us actually in the, the last verse of chapter 19 that it was because of unbelief that many did not enter in. And those who did enter in, entered in by faith. But here's the interesting thing. The promised land was a picture of God's rest, where Israel would have rest from their enemies, where they could plant and harvest and just be at rest. But the writer here tells us that that was not God's ultimate rest. Verse 8 says, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a rest for God's people. And that rest, as I said a moment ago, and as what the writer here is saying, that rest is in Christ. Now as believers, as those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and, and have been born again of his spirit, positionally, we have entered into God's rest. But again, let me ask the question. While positionally, we've entered into that rest, do we know that rest in our day-to-day -day experience? Are we experiencing that rest, that rest that God has given us in Christ. Do you know that rest today? Do you know it? All of that rest, the Sabbath rest, points towards Jesus. The one who called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of that rest. And yet works. He's the Lord of the Sabbath and yet on the Sabbath day he did many miracles. But do you know that rest? And what I want to focus on as we conclude is that rest that only Jesus himself can give. I want to read a, a few scriptures here which are very familiar from Matthew 11. You all know these verses. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew 11 verse 28. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Twice he speaks about rest. He offers us rest. And notice he defines what that rest is. It is rest for our souls, our minds, our emotions. What a blessing it is to know that rest in our minds and internally, to be free from anxiety and stress and fear which has torment. Now, let me say this, I don't want anybody to feel condemned because we all experience anxiety. We all know what it likes to be in situations where we're fearful. Don't let any, don't please, don't feel condemned. But the Lord gives us rest. He has a peace that passes all understanding, that guards our hearts and minds. Effectively, what Paul was saying is the same thing. Rest for our souls, peace to get us in our hearts like, like soldiers protecting us from the advance of the enemy, those fiery darts that would seek to trouble us and unsettle us and distract us. This whole concept of rest we see so wonderfully visually illustrated. When Jesus and the disciples were in the boat in the storm, the storm was raging and Jesus was fast asleep in a place of rest physically and he offers rest to us but he says if you want this rest first of all you have to come to me come he gives us the invitation to come to him that's the first step and then he goes on to say take my yoke upon you now the mention of the word yoke to that original audience would have conjured up images in their minds of oxen being yoked together, harnessed to a plow, positioned for work. And again, let me just say this in case anybody gets uh, some, uh, confused in any way. When I talk about work, in respect to rest. I'm not, I'm not saying, look, and the Bible makes it clear we're not saved by works. But this is a different kind of work. You see, the, the yoke of oxen, while they're yoked together and not harnessed to the ply, they're not accomplishing anything until they begin to move and pull the ply. And that imagery is what Jesus is using to speak about rest. And again, as I said at the beginning, it seems almost like a contradiction. We don't associate rest with any kind of work. But he says, take my yoke upon you. The rest he offers is for our souls. And the yoke that he asks us to take, he goes on to explain. And that yoke is his word, his teaching. Because he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In other words, he's saying, if you want to take my yoke, you need to adopt the posture of a learner. We need to be willing to submit to him and say, Lord, teach me. And so we take his yoke in order that we might learn from him because he has something to instruct us, to teach us. And his yoke is his teaching, his word, his will. And you see, as that song we sometimes sing, Lord, it's only in your will that I am free, that I am at rest. The old hymn, Blessed Assurance, says, perfect submission, all is at rest. As we take his yoke, as we submit to his word, to his teaching, 
we begin to enter into that rest that he has for us. And he doesn't force the yoke on us. He says, take it. He offers it. Take my yoke. Submit to it. Allow him to take the lead. He says, my yoke is easy. That must have been a breath of fresh air to the original audience that Jesus spoke that word to. Because you see, the religious people took the law of God, which was perfect and holy, but they twisted it. They modified it. They added to it. They made it say something it was never intended to say. And they forced it on the people. As Jesus said, they were teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They were putting their own spin on it. Twisting it. And passing it off as God's perfect law. And the people couldn't bear that yoke. It was wearisome. It, it led them into frustration, discouragement, disillusionment. And the religious people, Jesus told, them, told us, they would make the people do all of that, yet they wouldn't do it. They were hypocrites. And it's sad because there are many churches in this world where the, the leaders are imposing man-made rules on the people and they're being passed off as Bible, as God's word. And you see often man-made rules, they, they, well not often, they, they do, they appeal to pride. Because man-made rules are easily kept. But if people don't keep them, the ones who impose them get very annoyed and they get very proud that they can keep them. But the Word of God, the pure Word of God, when we walk in it, it doesn't feed ego or pride, but it generates the love of God. Now where the Bible is very clear, where issues in the Word of God are black and white, we must obey. But religion takes part of the Word of God and twists it, makes it say something it never was intended to say and is used to, like, like a club to beat, beat on Christians. And the result is they get wearisome and tired and frustrated and disillusioned. But Jesus says, submit to me. Let me teach you. My yoke's easy. My burden is light. You won't be crippled under the weight of it. You'll not be weary and frustrated and tired. You'll be revived. You'll be refreshed. That's where you know true rest. I will give you rest for your soul. Come to Jesus he said, and let me just, I don't want to press the, the illustration of the yoke too far. But the yoke that the oxen would be under. Jesus' yoke for you. His word for your life. His will for your life. The yoke he has for you is perfectly crafted. It's tailor-made. It fits you perfectly. It's not like a yoke maybe on animals where, where it's too tight and their, their necks rub against it and there's friction and irritation. The yoke he has for you will fit you perfectly. The yoke he has for me will fit me perfectly. Paul takes that sentiment and in 1 Corinthians 12 he describes it like this that whenever we are saved, born again, at that very moment we are made to be functioning members of the church. And some are called to act like a hand or a foot or an eye or an ear. We've all got a part. And the Lord's yoke for you 
will fit you perfectly. You will be at home. You will be satisfied. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Being yoked to an unbeliever will not bring rest. Being entangled with a yoke of bondage will not bring rest. Resisting against the Lord's yoke, pulling against his will, will not bring rest. Wearing the yoke of another will not bring rest. But allowing him to put his yoke upon us and to submit to his yoke, his word, his teaching, his will, that brings rest. And while we do that, while we submit to him and take his yoke, just like the oxen are under that yoke, they're under that yoke to serve the farmer. And when we take his yoke, we're under it to serve him. Not to work to earn our salvation, but to fulfill that purpose for which he has saved us and called us. And as we serve him, as we are yoked to him, that's where true rest and true satisfaction comes. Taking his yoke, learning from him, and serving him. Are you experiencing his rest right now in your situation? Is your mind tormented, confused, or is your mind at peace? Trusting him that he's got everything under control. That as you pray, he's working out all things according to good. Are you in rest this morning? He offers that rest to every one of us. And Father, I pray that we will all know your rest continually. Lord, regardless of the situation, we don't come out from under your yoke. We're still under your yoke. You have still things to teach us. You still have to lead us and guide us, Lord, despite the situation. And Lord, may we be a people willing to continue to trust you, to receive of your wisdom, to respond to you despite our circumstances, in order that we might still know your rest and experience that rest. Father, we thank you for the rest that you give because of relationship with your son and for that price that he paid. Father, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name.